Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley, wrapping up day two, getting down towards the end of the wire here for three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV, Big Data in Silicon Valley is part of in conjunction with Hadoop World, Strata Conference, all part of the Big Data Week uh, we're putting on here with the community. I'm John Furrier with Silicon Angle. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. My co-host Jeff Kelly, Chief Big Data Analyst at Wikibon. Uh, our next guest is David Smith, who's the Chief Community Officer at Microsoft with Revolution Analytics. Um, now recently joined with uh, Microsoft of the big announcement acquisition uh, of Revolution Analytics. Congratulations, welcome back. Thank uh, you. Changing jerseys, got the same number, well, name on the back. Well, I'm not officially a Microsoft employee yet. It's coming up very soon. Yet, I'm really uh, looking forward to technically, it. Technically, yeah. it's got to close yeah, and all yeah, that. All those details. Yeah. details. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's so funny, I was so excited when I saw the news. I you know, wrote a poster as fast as I could write. Mm -hmm. um, I you know, usually don't do that much anymore, but I'm like, oh, oh they just acquired R. And then the R community, yeah, R is not part of Revolution Analytics, so we <laughs> clarified. So, so that's out of the way, but you know, the success of analytics and R has been tremendous. We've talked many times on theCUBE here. So what's the update? Give us the update. So how did it all go down? Obviously, R, you guys have been successful. Yeah. Um, big growth, did they just come in saying, hey, we're going to take you off the table? What, what happened? Give us the update. Well, I think like everybody, Microsoft just must have seen the rapid growth of our, over the last you know, five or six years. Um, it's gone from being a language that was really only known in the academic sector, today being the, the lingua franca of data scientists everywhere. And you've just seen the rise of data science. I mean, data science, you know, that, that has been the theme of the conference this year. We, you know, we Every year, it's the year of the data scientists, right? Yeah, Every but, year. Yeah, but now it, it's about the applications and the impact. I mean, we have a chief data scientist for the US government now, yeah. mm. and talking about data science applications, you know, for fashion, for fashion, for manufacturing, you name it. We've gone from talking about the algorithms and the data to actually how they're applied. And, and for me, that's the big change. And I yeah. think you know, companies like Microsoft are recognizing that this is the way that companies are competing today and really want to be yeah. a part of that. And you think about the incumbent kind of company that Microsoft is, certainly the US yeah. government, you have DJ Patel, you have Megan Smith, you mm -hmm. have the VMware guy over there now, you got a yeah. tech crew coming in. You got Obama uh, um, on the big screen here in the event at Big Data SV and Strata Conference going, mm -hmm. hey, you know, this is mm -hmm. a new new era. Yeah, I, got, I got to say, that, like, that, that for me personally was so cool. Like, you know, I grew up being a statistician where you tell people you're a statistician at a, at a <laughs> party and they back away. And now to have the President of the United States coming up and giving a shout out to data scientists, I mean, that's just so awesome, it really is. It really exposes <laughs> some opportunities to yeah. create some efficiencies where it was hard to do before. Certainly Isn't cloud, it? mobile, yeah. social, that stuff's happening. But analytics really is a value, yeah. uh, harnessing mm -hmm. value, delivering value. Obama also was quoted just last week when he was in Silicon Valley, all kids should code. Yep. Uh, we had one person come on theCUBE and said, hey, you know, I'll tell my kids, you know, get your hands on R or Python if they're really Absolutely. techie. So data, this is going to be a new tool mm -hmm. that like a hammer and nails, uh, you know, to build out things is a key tool. Like we used to use spreadsheets and whatnot. So, that's right. so it's pretty cool. The other thing that's interesting, uh, besides <laughs> the government being efficient, more transparent using the data is Microsoft. Uh, Satya mm -hmm. Nadella has come on, made some big moves. We covered the open compute yep. uh, environment. They donated a bunch of stuff to mm -hmm. open source. A lot of moves with Azure in the cloud. You've seen some very positive movement there and now embracing R. So I got to ask you, the new Microsoft, if you will, mm -hmm. under Satya Nutella, is it, what's your experience been? And obviously they're embracing it through the acquisition, but what's the vibe there? I mean, is it like amazing? Is it like total yeah. transformation? I, I got to tell you, it, it's, it's like nothing I, I expected. You know, I, I've got to confess a little bit. I was a little bit skeptical when I heard that Microsoft <laughs> was interested in us, an open source company. But you know, as I dived in and looked closely, it's just been really incredible what Microsoft's done. You know, just even over the last year, when it comes to open source and innovation. Uh, you know, when you have a look at opensourcing.net, you know, they had already integrated R into the Azure framework, um, supporting Python. Um, you name it. And then you put on top of things like putting 
uh, Office on iOS or the uh, HoloLens goggles. You know, I think Microsoft's really got its mojo back, so I'm really excited. Well, that th we'll I think, I think that the team is just, it seems to me like it's all been like, okay, this little transition's over, Balmer steps aside now, okay, everyone's been itching <laughs> to like get out and like be competitive. Microsoft's culture is pretty hardcore. <laughs> you look at the old DNA, so it yep. seems like that's back. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's cool. So with all that, I got to ask you another question. Obviously the big news this week is the mm -hmm. open data platform where a lot of people getting behind this. Community's been a big part of open yep. source. So mm -hmm. I got to get your take. What is going on with community? We're seeing and we're evaluating and, and analyzing and doing research on this new era of, of community yep. governance, um, value creation. Open source is now in its kind of like mm -hmm. whatever nth generation. Yeah. Us old guys remember the value in the first couple mm -hmm. generations, but now it's like full on mainstream. Yeah. Everything's out in the open. You know, OpenStack's being successful. Even mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry was successful. Yep. And now this o ODP. Yep. What's the new governance model? What is the new community model? Is there anything you see that you can share yeah. with us? Like, why is this working differently? Everyone's been, mm. you know, naysayers been saying, no, it's never going to work, but mm. yeah, it's working. Yeah. What's I, the new thing? Yeah, I, I think what, what the big players have now recognized that when it comes to open source especially, community is the value. You know, when we've talked about open source in the past, it's really been about the technology, about the innovation, about the development, about its freeness. Um, but really, and you know, I've, I've said this a lot when it comes to R, it's the community itself that provides a significant portion of the value when it comes to uh, open source software. Um, not just in terms of the social connections, the networking, the, the marketing, the free marketing mm -hmm. essentially you get through communities, but the communities themselves vi drive the value. Uh, they contribute code, uh, they contribute documentation, they contribute expertise, and most importantly, they provide, uh, let me put it as a labor pool. You know, these are people from the community that you can recruit to help you develop and promote your own applications. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've seen that as one of the hugest drivers for R itself. You know, it's not just that it's the, an amazing language for developing data science applications. It's for companies when they're looking at putting together a data science project, they look at where we're going to find the people to actually mm -hmm. implement this. And where do they look to? They look to the community. What has the biggest community when it comes to data science? It's R, so it's a really a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. How's that transferring over into the mainstream? Obviously you mentioned academic, yeah. the values there. Mm -hmm. um, any bumps in the road, any, any uh, revelations, any uh, magnified learnings on your part on you know, things that you've observed and how it's, it's taking off now? I, I think experience is one part of it. I mean, especially when it comes to you know, open source languages, which are by definition young, you know, you're looking at you know, younger members of the community that are going to be part of that. That, that ecosystem. What are they like? What are the young guns like? I mean, you know, are they, yeah. what's, well, they, what's they the don't, psychology like? They, they don't have the gray beards <laughs> like me, you know, <laughs> around, you know, the IT experience and all those lessons learned over the years. But what they do have is a fresh set of values uh, when it comes to working in an IT infrastructure. You know, they're not, it's just natural for these young guns to take, you know, a, a, an open source program here and another package here and a data stream here and connect those all together. Yeah. Whereas I think in the past, there was this expectation that you do all that within a single technological stack. Yeah. And it's just a very different way of doing things. And the benefits- Are the young guns also like, what, provisioning servers? I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you know, what, we, no, IT I is giving it. us a problem, let's go around <laughs> IT and do it in the cloud, you know, all of those things like that. But what that means yeah. is that companies have recognized that by freeing up some of these constraints, um, that people can get so much more done so much faster and be able to innovate in ways that simply weren't possible without mm -hmm. being able to work in this, this type of uh, open source realm. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, yeah. and, and this being kind of you know, the year of data science, or data science is getting a little bit more attention mm -hmm. this year versus past years. Um, and I think, you're, I think you're right, because we were talking about, the conversation was m much more around kind of the plumbing and the infrastructure, yeah. and that conversation is now, uh, moving forward, and now you're getting to the data science. What are we going to actually do with all this data yeah. to drive some value? Mm -hmm. uh, was it frustrating for you as a, as a you know, an R, member of the R community that, that there wasn't, a, the, 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 that the community, the larger open source big data community wasn't moving faster and that we were spending too much time on the plumbing? I mean, what was that, what was that mm -hmm. like? Were you like chomping at the bit to like, hey guys, let's talk about what the real value is, well, which is the data science? Yeah, yeah. I think I was even seeing it the other way. I think, you know, I spent such a long time working in sort of the, the trenches of statistics and data science, doing all this really cool stuff that was really, in a lot of cases, only recognized in the back office mm -hmm. and was only exposed through several layers of IT <laughs> before. So nobody even realized that stats or advanced analysis was, was part of the picture. So I've look, been looking at it a different way and just seeing the growing exposure mm -hmm. of data science and the value it provides over the, the last five years mm -hmm. has just been so tremendous. And you know, just generating that recognition. Uh, I, I, one of my stories is, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of 
as I've worked as the community officer at Revolution Analytics uh, for R, is that you know, the work we've done to expose the benefits of R and data science in general has raised the salaries of people like me 20 years ago who were doing stats degrees or computer science degrees. And now it's one of the most sought after careers uh, out there today. So, you know, I, I think it's just a great recognition that companies- Do you want to rewind the clock and go back to that time? <laughs> oh yeah, like, like, if I'd had- walk into the parties and be like the guy. Yeah, like, if I'd had Silicon yeah. Valley salaries when I was back at school, <laughs> this would have been a very different conversation. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's just a real recognition of the value that companies are now, now putting into getting information out mm -hmm. of data and the investments they're making in the workforce mm -hmm. to do that. Talk about the, um, talk about salaries, yeah. it's interesting. We had this conversation earlier with uh, one of the PhDs up here um, mm -hmm. uh, from Simply Hire, and, you know, and this kind of a polarization going on between the purists, I'd call them the purists, mm -hmm. uh, and people who are recycling themselves as data scientists. Right. Talk about that, it's natural progression. Certainly people mm -hmm. are, are retooling. We came up yesterday at the, our, our panel at our event last yeah. night. You know, the big companies are laying mm -hmm. off, but rehiring younger and yeah. getting leaner for this new, new era. Mm -hmm. um, so they are, we do need more data science. Yeah. So talk about the definitions of, you know, through yeah. that and, and clarify that. And mm -hmm. people don't know if they're really looking at a data science. Is there yeah. a test? Is there a degree? Is there yeah. a look? Is there a beard? <laughs> I mean, come on, what is it? I mean, come on, is it? Yeah. What, what? I mean, there's definitely been scope creep, you know, when it comes to resumes and that data mm -hmm. scientist title. I mean, for me personally, I think it, it, it combines, you definitely got to have the maths and stats. You know, being able to apply these, these advanced statistical methods to data is a core part of being a data scientist. There's also the computer science jobs. You know, it's not just about having the math, you've got to be able to implement it in a computer system and do that successfully. And then you've also got to have some level of business acumen. You've got to know what is the problem you're trying to solve and what data and uh, mm -hmm. algorithms can be applied to that problem in a so way So more that's integrated really, discipline exactly. mindset. Now, that, that's, that's kind of the data scientist unicorn. It's hard to find all of those skills uh, in one person. Right. Uh, these days, people tend to be putting together the, the teams. Uh, but for somebody who perhaps you know, just only knows SQL and is calling themselves a data scientist, that's mm -hmm. a bit of a stretch for me personally. Yeah. But I think you know, where we're going on that front is, is not so much these days about hiring data scientists. You know, companies have kind of figured out that that's a core part of the institution. I think the next stage is going to be for companies to figure out how to actually take the research and the implementations that those data scientists are doing in the lab and ex uh, effectively operationalize yeah. them throughout the organization. How can we make data science for the masses? Now data science for the masses doesn't mean that uh, an MBA is going to be implementing a, a generalized boosting algorithm on a data <laughs> set, but what it means is being able to expose the company specific applications that data scientists develop and make them available to their MBA so they can apply them to the data sets of their choice mm -hmm. in a nice interactive environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, but you mentioned a moment ago around the, the whole idea of this team concept to mm -hmm. data science. We had on a, uh, the chief data scientist from Simply Hired earlier today yeah. and he was talking about the same thing, that yeah. the idea of finding that unicorn is, <laughs> is challenging and so the, the method that they've chosen is really this more team approach. Yes. Um, is that something you're seeing proliferate? Uh, all the, the time, market? all the time. You know, it's a matter of matching the skills of the, the, the different people around the stats, around the computer science, around the business side, and having them work together. And that in itself is something that's relatively new because these were operations that were institutionalized in entirely different departments mm -hmm. at one time. But now by bringing those skills together, people are able to understand the problems they need to solve, apply these advanced methods to them, and then deploy them into the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And in terms of operationalizing yeah. data science, which is, I think is a, it's a great, great way to look at it, yeah. because you know, ultimately, that's where a lot of the value is going to be created. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you've got to find the insights, but then you've got to apply them in the yeah. real world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are some of the ways uh, that you see people doing that, the, the, the kind of cutting edge uh, approaches people are taking to actually moving data science from the back room mm -hmm. to you know, out front, whether that's touching a customer or uh, employees or whoever the case might be. Yeah, well a lot of that has been through um, you know, production operation, oper operationalization uh, of you know, data science algorithms. You, know, you, you have a bunch of data scientists out there in the back office, uh, they're working with big data in Hadoop in a database. In a database, uh, they generate a predictive model, and then that get r gets run in real time in mm -hmm. some kind of operational system. So you're kind of going right from the the developers, the data scientists, right to the consumer. I think where I see things going is that there, there's going to be more of an interim step there, in that the data scientists can develop modules. You know, for example, you know. They have the expertise around uh, doing predictive maintenance mm -hmm. for you know, a big manufacturing company. But that manufacturing company has lots of different products that are in the field that are going to break at some point. So being able to deploy 
those algorithms into an application that an operations manager can then use to apply to the aircraft engines and the aircraft wheels and the tarmac and everything else. Um, so that they're not a data scientist themselves, but they can lean on the expertise mm -hmm. of those data but scientists. But do it in a flexible way where flexible you're not building way. siloed apps every exactly. one, one after another. Yeah, so, so one you know, really cool app that I've been taking a look at recently, obviously, has been the Azure ML Studio framework. You know, it's, it's cloud-based, it's nice drag-and-drop type environment where data scientists can publish algorithms written in R or Python or anything else, and then somebody who can just work in a drag and drop environment can apply those to the data, science, uh, the data sets, rather, they can select from the environment. I think that's a nice hybrid way of doing mm -hmm. that, exposing the expertise of those deep data scientists to the people that actually need to actually apply those models on the ground. So talk about the uh, competition now. Yeah. Obviously, you're at Microsoft, you're the yeah. big company. Um, we were talking earlier about the difference between systems of engagement, systems of record, all the stuff that's going on in big mm -hmm. data. There's a lot of land grabbing going on. The middle layer is going kind of open. You're seeing that with, yeah. with these announcements. But you know, underneath the covers, converged infrastructure, cloud, mm -hmm. and then the apps all, all kind of make sense. The apps have clear visibility. Converged infrastructure is making sense. Um, R is not owned by Revolution Analytics. That's it's, it's an open, it's an open, open framework mm -hmm. source, all that good stuff. We heard Oracle saying, "Hey, we're getting behind R." Yeah. So everyone's getting behind. Everyone's R. So, IBM's getting so behind. R. <laughs> R is R. Right? Yeah. R is a beautiful thing. Yeah. So, so what does that mean for Microsoft? What edge do they have with you guys? Can you share that? Because mm -hmm. you know, some people think Cloudera is Apache. Yeah. Horton works with Defer, mm -hmm. Differ, yep. but it's open. So everything's happening in the open. Is R the same way? Is there any nuances that we need to know about? And, and how does Microsoft compete with you guys? Yeah, I think it goes back to community. I mean, R is not just the bits and bytes. It's not just the, the language engine. It's the community as well. And I think that that's what Microsoft is looking to Revolution Analytics for, is that community aspect. You know, being able to bring the R community in general into these other domains where R has been embedded into other applications. And being able to, giving them a venue, the R community members, for exposing uh, the applications and the code that they develop into more and more frameworks. And any changes you see coming with all this market movement, obviously the community is still growing, there's no real problems that we see out there, I mean. Community's been growing so strongly, and you know, in fact, R is even increasing in popularity. You know, it's always been hard to measure the popularity of open source applications, but I've seen uh, at least three surveys in the last six months uh, that rank R as the 12th most popular language of all programming languages, including general purpose. I'd love to see like that C. survey in yeah. with R visualizing it for us. That, that brings <laughs> well, most of them do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How complimentary, obviously a good yeah. survey. Um, what about the innovation side of it? Okay, yeah. so what's coming on? What do you see on the innovation side in the community? What's on the radar? What do you see as opportunities, white mm -hmm. spaces? Share your perspective there. Yeah, well I think, um, more and more of the sort of deep stats algorithms that previously existed only in the research side. Uh, what we day today talk about deep learning is really just statistical algorithms that we've known about for a long time applied to new domains. Uh, the technical aspect of that, of course, is applying these algorithms to these big data sources. Mm -hmm. um, to, it, there's some challenges there and being able to implement them. So I see a lot of research in those areas about taking these algorithms that we've known about for a long time and retooling them to run in Hadoop or in databases. And I think that's definitely going to continue. Um, so, Jeff, I got to ask you, what do you think about this? You're the analyst. I mean, <laughs> Microsoft. I mean, we were talking about this on the news. I mean, mm -hmm. big move. What's your take well, I think on your research yeah. yesterday? You reported kind of mm -hmm. like the big, the rich getting richer. Is it? Well, we, yeah, we're seeing acquisitions. Um, Revolution Analytics is an example of that. I mean, I think this is an illustration that the big companies out there, the Microsofts, IBM's, uh, SAPs of the world, recognize that big data is is going to be critical to their future success. Um, they have to align with the uh, tools like and, and approaches like R that are gaining popularity with data scientists. These are the, the people that are going to drive this shift from kind of, you know, uh, I don't want to call them dumb applications, but to intelligent and automated, in, autom intelligently automated applications <laughs> using things like machine, al machine learning, algorithms built with R, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think you're probably going to see more of the acquisitions in this space because that's, because the other thing is that it's part of a larger stack, right? So it's, it's not just the algorithms, not just the languages, it's the underlying infrastructure, it's the way you actually um, can, can consume that in the enterprise, whether that's cloud, and then ultimately you're building applications that you're going to roll out on your mobile device. So it, it, when, you t when you look at mobile, analytics, cloud, yeah. and social, those are the three, those are the big four areas, right? And I think the big companies are recognizing that. The challenge, of course, is 
um, you know, it's going to be a it's going to be a painful transition for some of them. I mean, we've heard about you know potentially uh, uh, pretty massive layoffs maybe coming at IBM. Um, so they're kind of going through this transition of going from the legacy world to this new world, and it could be a painful transition for some of these big yeah. companies. Uh, but for the ones that can come out the other side and make the smart moves going through that transition, I think there's massive opportunity. Yeah, and I, I think IBM gets gets um, beaten up a bit on the um, on the Wall Street because obviously their performance has been down with this transition. But in the long game, they're tooling in the right area in my mind. Cloud, I mean, they got to do some work on Blue Mix. Certainly, they are running. Mm -hmm. But their analytics vision is pretty solid. I mean, I like insights. In fact, we interviewed Michael Jordan from Berkeley um, recently uh, on, the, on the ground segment of the Cube in San Francisco. I asked him about the difference between math and computer science, and he says, "Well, it's like it's exactly what you said. You know, there's, it, there's a creative aspect of it that you got to put that third dimension. But yeah, certainly, if you got computer science chops and math, and you got some mm -hmm. sort of creative visibility, you're good." Mm -hmm. But he says, "There's a big difference though between confidence." you know, sentiment bar charts and like feeling good about stuff versus getting answers to things. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the focus we're seeing. So mm -hmm. I want to get your comment on that. Yeah. This answers, this insight engine is the holy grail, which is yeah. using predictive analytics, all kinds of analytics yeah. to get what you want. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, so I, I think what we'll see is a move from exploration into applications. So, you know, a lot of what we've been doing with big data has been just really about getting access to data, exploring that data, visualizing it, just as you said. Even being able to look at big data has, has been a, a challenge both technically and kind of philosoph philosophically. What's the right way to look and explore our data? And I think we've learned a lot of great lessons out that, through that process, and now we're ready to actually turn those observations into applications. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what we'll start to see is, is you start getting that magic factor, you know, at the consumer level. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a presentation this morning from a guy at Toyota talking about a very near future when your car will tell you before it has a fault and you know, be able to you know, get these things corrected before things actually happen. And from the point of view of the consumer, you're not going to understand all the sensor data that led to that, all the models mm -hmm. that, that led to that prediction, but when you can actually avoid a breakdown, you know, that is going to make a big kind well, of a difference. What I think is interesting at in Microsoft yeah. is, you know, obviously Microsoft is, is strong in applications, mm -hmm. so if they can bring in some of that big data um, magic, if you will, yeah. and infuse that into some of the business applications that people are, are accustomed to working with. There's a huge opportunity there. Exactly. And what I like about what, what uh, Nadella is doing is really, he's really adopting what we talked about earlier today mm -hmm. with uh, Bill Schmarzo around mm -hmm. open business models. You've yep. got to open up to exactly. the rest of the ecosystem, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, examples of that are you know, working now, bringing revolution analytics in an open source mm -hmm. company, yep. um, you know, making, uh, uh, Office available on, yeah. on other platforms, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. When you start to see that, combined with the, the acknowledgement and the um, understanding that big data is going to play an important role, I think there's a huge opportunity for Microsoft. Talk okay. about security now, because this <laughs> is something that, that's come out. I mean, I know you're not a security expert, but yeah. in visualization, that's been a big part of seeing um, that kind of data set. So security brings up the notion of, hey, I want to see things. That's the instrumentation to applications. Right. Yeah. Um, that's been hype. Have you seen anything there in the R community with security? Is there any updates there? That was just recently come up in our last segment uh, with our data scientists. Not so much on the security side, but I think it, it's related to a similar topic, which is around data ethics. Um, you know, especially once you start working with very, very fine-grained data sets. It does require a certain amount of care and knowledge, like even when it comes to visualization, um, to not to expose personal information, for example. Uh, you know, this is something that, again, going back stati to statistics, that the Census Bureau has learned about over the years. You know, this is why you can't drill down into individual zip codes in census data. And I think this is something that, again, that data scientists learn as part of their education, is how to ethically and constructively handle data like that in a way that you don't expose ethical confidentiality and security issues. And that's why I think the expertise of data scientists is so valued by companies, specifically to avoid those types of issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things that comes up too is this, are we in a bubble or, or, or a wave? And mm -hmm. you know, it always comes up, certainly valuations are out of control. We had a VC panel yesterday. Yeah. And I argued that it's bubblicious, but it's not super bubblish like mm -hmm. dot-com. I mean, yeah. actually the dot-com bubble, everything yeah. that they mm -hmm. talked about happened. Yeah. It's just different valuations. Um, but there's waves of other stuff coming. So I want to get your perspective uh, as someone who's been around the block a few mm -hmm. times and seen some waves. Mm -hmm. What's, what waves are coming? You can mention you know, discovery, to our exploration or discovery into applications. Okay, what other waves are coming in big data? Yeah. Hadoop seems to be a done deal. We're like, okay, we're done, we agree. Hadoop's good, yep. now move on, move faster, hence the consortium or what, whatnot. Mm -hmm. But what's the next wave? Is it Internet yeah. of Things? Is there other things? What's yeah. your take? I mean, just on that point of bubble versus wave, you know, I've been through a couple of bubbles, uh, and this, this feels very different to me. And, and the difference is, is that 
companies are really using the stuff that the vendors are talking about <laughs> just to solve their problems, not just, you know, just pretending. Um, so that's kind of point number one. But I think, you know, just in terms of, you know, where that next wave's come from, I don't really see a big turning point here. I think it's a continuation of what we've seen. Um, we've, I think you, you, your point is correct that we've, you know, really sorted out what happens at the data level. I think we've established now that data science is the way to make use of that data and, and exploit that data, if you will. And now I see, as I said earlier on, the next sort of evolution there being actually applications that hit the consumers that really exploit the data science and the data in ways that we, uh, we're just starting to see now. Well, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Great to see the, the, the new success with the acquisition, change in jerseys, keeping the same mission. Um, what's the objective? What do you, what do you got on your to-do list? Obviously now more resource, certainly Microsoft. Yep. Uh, good budget behind mm -hmm. you, good, good resource. Maybe some bloatedness, if you will, but they're, they're working on that. Mm -hmm. Um, what's 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 the what's the mandate? What's the what's the yeah. to-do list? I mean, me on a on a personal level, you know, my mission is to continue to support the success of the R community, which is growing so rapidly, and the R project itself, uh, and to bring R into even more enterprises um, as as that language for implementing these data science applications. David Smith, CUBE alumni, Chief Community Officer at Revolution Analytics, now part of Microsoft, not officially, but soon will be. <laughs> it's just dot the I's, cross the T's. Indeed. Congratulations, great to see you. We're here live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV, part of Strata Conference and Hadoop World. We're excited to be part of Big Data Week here in Silicon Valley. It's theCUBE, we'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>